For your car to operate the way its almighty engineer intended it to, its individual systems gotta be in the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold. That goes for the engine, the tires, even the driver. But one component that often gets unnoticed are your brakes. Too cold, you get this. Too hot, you get this. So today, we're gonna figure out why temperature is so important for your brakes. And to do that, we're taking a little field trip to Willwood Engineering to see how engineers manipulate brake components to maximize their stopping power. You can manipulate brakes, but you can't manipulate me. I'm unmanipulatable. I just had to grow out that mustache, Jerry. Thank you, Eddie. That compliment gave me the confidence to grow it out. Let's go. Thanks to Cove for sponsoring today's video. This isn't just some regular old Bluetooth sound machine. Oh no, it's the new Casita boom box from Cove. This box straight up booms at 60 high capacity full blast watts. And because it's rechargeable, it'll most likely boom all day long. Uh. It even features Quick Connect Bluetooth 5.0, which makes it perfectly accessible for blasting music in kitchens, offices, bedrooms, holiday parties, wherever you feel the need to dance. Hell yeah. Get my dance on, son. Yeah. But what's that? You want to dance with the casita? No problem. Grab it by the handle for easy movement. And the cool features don't end there because you can bring even more boom to your music by clicking this. Mm. This awesome M button provides you with three different listening modes. You got standard, you got outdoor, and you got freaking 3D. <laughs> now listen up, there's a limited number of casitas available. So if you want the perfect gift for your holiday season, head on over to coveaudio.com slash donut box and make sure you use code donut box to get 68% off or more for a limited time site wide. Now let's boom. Back to the show. Just gonna take this here. We don't need this anymore. Mm, this is how I carry products out of the office. Oh, what do you got in your jacket? Nothing. <laughs> Heat is the enemy of braking. Even though most brakes don't work great when they're extremely cold, brakes have no trouble making heat and a hard time getting rid of it. When brakes get overheated, they don't stop well and they can fail completely. That's more of a problem on high performance and racing cars than a typical road car, but almost all cars use braking systems that operate the same way. To understand why temperature matters so much, we first need to see how brakes work and they're not that complicated. For a typical braking setup, there are three main parts at each wheel. There's the disc, the caliper, and the pads. The disc or rotor, as people call it, is attached to the hub or axle and rotates along with the wheel. As it rotates, the disc passes through a stationary caliper that holds the pads. When you step on the brake pedal, this increases hydraulic pressure in the caliper, pushing a piston into the backside of the brake pad, which presses it against the face of the disc. Manufacturers of road cars, especially electric cars, have recently introduced electronic braking systems. We did a whole B2B about those, so check that out over here if you want to understand the differences, but those still rely on discs, calipers, and pads, and despite their name, they still use hydraulic pressure to create braking force. So the heat problem applies to those systems as well. The biggest difference though is in the pedal, because in an ordinary hydraulic braking system, the resistance you feel with your foot is actually the pressure in the hydraulic fluid. In an electronic system, pedal feel is simulated with a separate hydraulic or electrical system. But for today, we're gonna stick with the juicy stuff, because that's what you'll find on most performance cars and at the racetrack. The, oh, the, the, the fluid that takes the paint off your car if you ever spill it on there. Been there, brother. How your brakes work is pretty simple. Friction between the disc and pads slows the wheel and that friction is produced by an increase in hydraulic pressure. But the two physical principles that make brakes work, friction and pressure, both create heat. And heat is what makes brakes stop working. Friction is just the force opposing motion between two surfaces. And your brakes work by using frictional force to convert kinetic energy into heat energy. With greater friction, more kinetic energy can be converted into heat. But you already understand this. It's why we rub our hands together when we're cold. When a brake pad and a disc really love each other, they make friction, baby. Oh. The amount of kinetic energy is based on the speed at which the two surfaces are moving relative to each other. So the faster you move your hands or the faster a brake disc is rotating, the more kinetic energy it has. Not a lot of kinetic energy. 
lot of kinetic energy. The amount of friction is determined by the materials the two surfaces are made of. Any two materials have a specific coefficient of friction, a number usually represented by the Greek letter mu. Mu is like you, but with a little tail. It's a U with a droopy neck. That's why brake pads are sometimes described in terms of their mu factor or mu level. The higher that number is, the more friction they produce. But the total amount of friction between two surfaces also depends on how much force is pressing them together. In physics, that's Amaton's first law. The force of friction is directly proportional to the applied load. So if you rub your hands together gently, there's not much friction and they don't produce much heat. But if you really put some muscle into it, you can feel the heat in no time. Mm. The muscle in your brakes depend on the hydraulic pressure, and you already know about the direct relationship between pressure and heat. It's how a pressure cooker works, or a diesel engine, or even why a can of soda left in a hot car can explode. As temperature increases, so does pressure, and as pressure increases, so does temperature. That's why I get hot when I'm forced to release these episodes. For a hydraulic system like brakes, which uses pressure to generate force, every time you step on the pedal and increase that pressure, it also increases the temperature of your brake fluid. Stopping an object completely requires enough friction to turn all of its kinetic energy into heat. And in the case of a car, that can mean a lot of heat. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. It's directly proportional to mass. So the heavier a moving car is, the more energy it has. But kinetic energy also increases as the square of speed. So a car moving 40 miles per hour has four times the kinetic energy as it does when it's going 20 miles an hour. At 60 miles an hour, the same car has nine times as much kinetic energy as it does at 20 and so on and so forth. All that kinetic energy being turned into heat by the brakes is absorbed in the discs, pads, calipers, and even hydraulic fluid. In a road car under normal driving, that heat dissipates into the air and you're unlikely to notice any problems. But in performance applications that require repeated hard braking, heat is a major concern. Excessive heat can warp discs as the metal softens and deforms, reducing the contact surface with the pads. A pad's mu factor also changes with temperature and at a certain point, they won't produce enough friction to stop the car. Overheating the brake pads can crack the material or cause it to glaze, meaning it turns smooth and glassy, no longer able to produce enough friction even once it's cooled. Heat can damage or rupture the rubber seals in the caliper, causing leaks that reduce hydraulic pressure. And heat can boil the brake fluid, turning it into a gas. So we understand that heat is the enemy of brakes. So to find out how engineers manage brake temperatures, we went to Willwood Engineering, where one of the major tasks when designing high-performance brakes is getting rid of all of that heat. So I'm here at Willwood Engineering in Camarillo, California. Camarillo, California. They got production, they got manufacturing, they got it all. We're gonna walk around and I'm gonna ask questions and figure out how these guys engineer better braking systems. Let's go. Come on, come on Grant, let's go. I hear you're the man uh, who's gonna give me a show this place, huh? <laughs> yeah, what's up, dude? Yeah. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Good to have you here, this Jeremiah. Is, this is Mike. Uh, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you got going on here? What we've got going on is, this is where all of the r and D's done. So we bring cars in, we test fit stuff, we design new brake systems. And then from here, we're gonna walk you through the shop, kind of show you like the progression of how stuff's made, but primarily calipers, because that's our primary stuff. Okay, cool. Cool? Yeah. Let's do it. So, primarily caliper manufacturing, but like that caliper is our Dynalite. You've probably heard of that caliper. Yes, sir, yeah. So that one machine with one operator will do 250 inboard and outboards in an eight hour shift. Oh, dang. Okay. And very few fa failure rate. This is like the most common caliper that we sell in a lot of our street applications. Yeah, yeah. But also some race applications. Okay. All right, cool. So over here, there's one last thing that I think you'll you'll kind of trip out on. So this, this, this is like where we used to get all of our dyno information. And we're talking from 35 years ago. Okay. So this was- The OG setup? This is super OG. In fact, when I started here, it was still running on DOS. Oh, nice. But there's no reason now for us to change any of this. Uh-huh, it works. Well, we bed brake pads now with it. Oh, okay. So we're not extracting any data from it anymore. Uh -huh. Basically what we're doing is pre-bedding for race applications, brake pads and rotors, gotcha. and we'll even do it together for a race team. So can you explain what bedding and brakes means? So 
The bedding procedure is super important when you're talking about high coefficient of friction, high temperature applications. What happens is it's kind of tough to take your race car and drive it up and down the street here and even get it hot enough to get all of the saturation in the system so that the binder that's inside the brake pad gets onto the face of the rotor. Okay. We don't want just the face of the rotor or the face of the brake pads to be hard. Right. We want all of the system to get hard. The entire rotor, right. Or the, right? the entire system, right. Forging, Seventy-one, seventy-five, or the forgings that you saw out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so before, when we were in the dyno, you were talking about saturation temperature and how all the individual components, when they get up, they need to get up to temp to perform optimally, right? Correct. What happens when you pass that threshold? What happens? You, that's when you start experiencing fade. Okay. So when you start to experience fade, you know, one of the, one of the first things that'll start to happen is maybe you don't have the right brake fluid. Mm -hmm. You might have like a dot three brake fluid and you really need to step up to a dot four, mm -hmm. something that has a higher boiling point. Mm -hmm. um, so the next thing is rotors are very important. This is one of our premium spec 37 race rotors. Mm -hmm. And it's not only directional vein, it's also staggered vein. What we learned from testing was if we were to close this stagger, there wasn't enough air getting flown. So now we've got way more capacity. We can cool off the rotor a lot better. Mm -hmm. Super important. Okay, so here we have two different types of brake pads and you said two different ways that they were manufactured. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how is this made right here? So this, this backing plate you can see is flush, right. right? There's no holes in it. That one's right. got holes. Right. So anything that we're going to do for racing, we don't want holes mm -hmm. because that's going to add deflection in the pad, mm -hmm. right? The other thing about this, this pad is it was made with NRS. So feel that. Gotcha. So that's what's getting that to grip onto this piece of metal right here, right? I hate to say the word, but it's almost like Velcro, okay. right? Yeah. So when we manufacture this particular type of setup, under super high heat and pressure, we press the material onto this backing plate. Mm -hmm. you, you know, obviously um, the material pad composition is a huge influence or the factor when it comes to the coefficient of friction of the pad, temperature range as well. Is there a specific compound in particular that higher temperature pads have in it that allow for that ability to take that much heat? So all the pads that we're talking about today are gonna be what we sell, which are semi-metallic. Semi-metallic, okay. So here's the thing that I don't even know mm -hmm. is the ratios for different pad formulations. Okay. Some might have more nickel, more copper, mm -hmm. more beryllium, mm -hmm. different things that cause the pad to do what you're asking it to do. Right, so different secret formulations of metals in this pad determine the temperature range Absolutely. and the coefficient of friction. Okay. And in a lot of cases, like I joke around, but... Sergio, extension 209. Sergio, extension 209. Sergio, what's up, man? I was hoping you were going to be able to tell me the secret formula. No. It's cool. It's cool. You don't have to do that. <laughs> no, I'm not yeah. going to. All right, so all of our engineering staff is here in building number one. Mm -hmm. So we do all of our dyno testing when we've got a new project, when we've got friction materials that we want to try right. or test. Right. So this is our link. Now, this is pretty much state-of-the-art um, dynamometer for doing brake systems. Okay. Um, it's all electric. It has the capacity to be able to give you the inertia of 30,000 pounds. Oh, wow. So you can change, you can do calipers, pads, rotors, all in this one yes. machine? Okay, great. We're gonna get to run it. Yeah. I get to hit the big big button over there. <laughs> That's the turnoff button. <laughs> you don't want to hit that. They don't know that. They don't know that. A brake diameter or dynamometer or brake dyno is often used to measure the amount of power a car is transmitting to its axles, but can also be used to measure the force of a braking system. Advanced brake dynos like the one at Willwood can even be programmed to run simulations of specific racetracks to determine the conditions the brakes will face over the course of a race, helping engineers choose the best braking setup.
Willwood Engineering has been designing and building performance brake components for 45 years. They make everything from high performance pads and big brake kits for road cars to fully custom setups for racing. I got a set of Willwood brakes on the old Catfish Camaro. They get me out of the jam when I'm going too fast, but I drive a speed limit. Most brake discs are made from iron. These are cheap and effective, but they're also heavy. So some race cars will use steel, which can be made thinner, lighter, and has greater thermal conductivity, meaning they dissipate heat faster. But steel wears quicker and is more prone to warping than iron. Aluminum dissipates heat better than steel, but it also has a lower melting point, so it's only used for lightweight applications like motorcycles or as the hub component of a two-piece rotor with a disc made of iron, steel, or carbon ceramic. That's what's used on some of the most expensive performance cars in the world, like the Bugatti Chiron and Remax Navera, because a two-piece carbon ceramic brake disc can be made large, lightweight, and heat resistant, at a cost, of course. Carbon brakes, they can be as much as 21 grand if you want the option them for your Porsche 911 Turbo, for example example. That's like, a, that's like a car. <laughs> you buy a whole car for that. Keeping a brake disc cool isn't just about the material. Size and construction matter too. Big brake kits like the ones designed by Willwood use larger discs. Larger discs means heat is spread out more and their greater surface area means more disc is exposed to cool air, all of which helps dissipate heat. Engineers will also design discs with vents, wave pattern slots, grooves, dimples, and holes to increase surface area and create passages for hot gases to be channeled away from the disc. Pads have a huge impact on braking performance. Like tires, each pad has a unique compound. That's the mixture of materials it's composed of. And just like tires, the compound determines the amount of grip or friction it can produce and the temperature range at which it works. Like tires, brake pads don't work well if they're too cold or too hot. Pads fall into three general types. You got organic, ceramic, and metallic. Organic pads are made from materials like glass, rubber, and Kevlar bonded together with resin. A lot of road cars come with organic pads because they're quiet, but they also don't create a lot of friction and wear quickly under hard braking, so they're a poor choice for performance applications. Ceramic pads are made from ceramic fibers. They're incredibly durable and good at dissipating heat, but like carbon ceramic brakes, they're incredibly expensive. So they're the least common of the three types. Most performance pads are metallic, made from a combination of metal shavings and resin. Metallic pads can include copper, steel, graphite, brass, but the exact mixture of any specific pad is a closely guarded secret, like Kentucky Fried Chicken's recipe. By varying the materials in the pad compound, engineers can dial in pads to work at just the right temperature for different applications and to avoid brake fade. That's when the pads get too hot to work and the amount of friction it produces drops off. In the quest for speed, many enthusiasts add power and they don't spend much time thinking about brakes. But when engineers think about speed, brakes are an essential part of that equation and maintaining the right brake temperature is vital for hard stops and fast laps. On a racetrack, speed on the straights doesn't do you any good if you can't get rid of it before the next turn. Ho, 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 ho. Happy holidays, donut fans. We want to personally let y'all know it's your last chance to order donut swag before, before the, holidays. the holidays. Get your orders in before December 10th. And never forget, because we I, I am, am boys. I'm a donut boy. I'm going to keep it. I'm a donut boy. I'm going to keep it. I'm a donut boy. I'll be eating all it up. It's so good. I'll be eating them crumbs. I'm like, oh, I go so dumb. Mm. I love donuts. Shout out to Donut Media fans. I want to thank everybody at Woolwood Engineering who helped out with this episode. Those guys are great over there. If you want more information about them, uh, we'll put a link down in the description below. If you want to see more videos about the catfish, watch this video over here. Man, I think it's looking sick, isn't it? Woo! This gets me all hot inside. Follow us here on Instagram at Donut Media. Follow me at Jeremiah Burton. If you want more donut content, you just got to have more. Click that join button below. They'll put you in the uh, Donut Underground. You get stickers, you get Discord chat access. You can chat it up with me in the Discord, a bunch of extra videos and stuff. Um, we thank you guys so much for watching. If you thought this video was good, hit that like and subscribe. It's a free way to let us know we're doing a good job. Uh, until next week, bye for now.